to know. I want to believe in a creator, but then I'm still trying to find out whose truth is the truth about the creator. Because I want to believe that there, there is something out there, because I don't really want to fall into the, um, the realm of believing that everything around us is coincidental. So what I would suggest to you is that if you are convinced that this could not have just happened by accident, and that the universe itself needs an explanation as to where it came from, then it would be quite rational, I think, to believe in this almighty creator that's responsible for everything. That wasn't what was meant, it was actually this. So because it's a, it's a limitation of any language, right? or perhaps not a limitation necessarily of language, but the limitation of human beings to interpret the language or to know what the essence was that was meant at the time of writing it. So for example, say in, in British law, if they said, you know, uh, self-defense, uh, yeah, a man who defends his life or a woman who defends her life and they end up killing the other person, it would, be, it would come under not murder. It, we might not even consider it as manslaughter. We would just say it was self-defense. Justifiable homicide, right? Now, but even within that, there might be so much to interpret. Well, okay, hold on a second. You're a very strong lad. The guy that you were apparently in a commotion with was like five foot one and weighed 75 uh, you know, kilos, right? So, you know, maybe he shouldn't have killed him, right? Now, if the, if the tables are turned, maybe he'd be justified in, in killing you because you're a big, strong guy, right? So there's always an interpretation. Now, one of the very interesting things Allah says in the Quran, Allah says, you know, that there are explicit verses and some that are ambiguous. In other words, there's a room for interpretation. And the people with the disease in their hearts will turn to the ambiguous ones. Okay, I see. So if it's ambiguous, the best policy is to not address it? No. If it's ambiguous, the best policy is to really try your utmost by scholarship and scholarship consensus to arrive at a firm uh, conclusion as to what it means rather than you yourself because it could potentially mean different things if you have a lack of knowledge or understanding, you decide to interpret it to fit your own agenda. Okay, I see what I mean. You understand then, what I'm saying? But then, the other thing I needed to, to know, understand from you, so when they are implementing the Sharia, yes. what happens when, because you've got these different schools of thought, yes. Hanafi, Hanabi, yes. Hanabi yes. Shafi, yes. Maliki, yes. how does that then work in enabling that sh sh Sharia to be 100% perfect? The first, first of all, no interpretation is ever going to be 100% uh, perfect. We're human beings, right? All we can do is we can do our best. So we're told that if a scholar that uh, genuinely makes a mistake, he does his best, but he gets it wrong, he'll get one reward. What reward is that? One reward for doing his best. Okay. Even though he made a mistake in interpreting the Sharia. The scholar who, get, who, who gets it right, will get two rewards. Well, who decides which right or wrong? Well, according to Allah. Okay. Right? So, so according to God, if that person made a mistake, but it was a genuine mistake, Allah will still reward him because he's trying his utmost to try to do what's good for the people. If, however, uh, he gets it right, Allah gives him two rewards. So this is the mercy. This is the mercy of God. So, but, but, all of that makes a lot of sense now talking to you about it and the Khalifa they're choosing through a uh, democratic process. Is he present? Sorry, big, big. Anis, am I plugging this into something? Yeah. So, uh, see, the, see the, uh, is, or is it like the Catholic Church when they choose the Pope? No. So what would happen is when, for example, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, died, a group of the most knowledgeable companions uh, who were regarded by the people to be the most, uh, you know, competent and religious, they did a shura 
and they decided a, 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 a meeting, a meeting, a meeting right? A, a, a discussion or a uh, you know um, a shura would be a, a, a de- not a debate, but it would be a, a meeting basically to ascertain who the best person should be to lead. All right. So they chose Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. When he died, another group came and they decided it should be Umar Khattab radiallahu anhu. When he passed away, another group was formed and they chose Ali radiallahu anhu, the ch- uh, Prophet's uh, um, uh, nephew, right? And that group, how did they come into fruition? The people vote, choose them or who chooses them? So, the, so effectively, it would be the people who would decide that uh, really? that you are the best really to lead us. So for example, in, in Islam, the way that democracy works or uh, the way the will of the people works is that if I live in a town called, say, Redbridge, we would call a meeting for the people of Redbridge to come and we would put forward who we think is a good person to represent us in Redbridge. Okay? I, if I chose you, I said, this guy is a very upkeep, uh, you know, is, is very honest, decent, is very educated. You know, I think we should choose this person. If the group decide that this person is good for us, you will then go to the Shura meeting of all of those who have been elected. And then you amongst yourselves will decide who the Amir should be for the whole group, for the whole country. Now, if you're not doing your job, the group can form again and say, look, he's not doing his job. He's co- Actually, he's done this wrong, done that wrong. We don't want him anymore. We want this person. They choose another person. That person then becomes your local representative. All of the local representatives would meet and they would then decide who the Khalif should be. So in choosing, they're going through a democratic process well, to choose. Well, the problem with democracy is... the when way I say democracy, I don't understand mean, what like... you're saying. It's the will of the people. The, the, the problem is, in Islam, what we say, for example, is anyone, the Prophet ﷺ said, who stands up to be elected, wants leadership, craves, desires leadership, should not get it. Because usually, the one who craves it is not the best person. So it's the one who doesn't want it who will be chosen. And in fact, Umar Khattab, he said, I don't want the Khalifat. I don't want the leadership. It's a big responsibility. And they said, Amir al Muminin, there's nobody left. We want you. They literally forced him to accept it. And and this is a, this is a sign of a good leader. Because he he realizes that the responsibility that's on my shoulders and the accountability to God is so great. And I have to be so squeaky clean that you know, I don't want this responsibility. And those are usually the best people to lead you. So when he's then chosen as the Khalifa, who has the real power within the Sharia? Is it the, the selected group of elder so, scholars who chose the Khalifa? No, the Khalifa? the Khalifa would make the final decision. He makes the final decision. But he would obviously do, I mean, Islam is a sunnah. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that when you do things, do it with uh, mashwara, do it with uh, uh, a, a discussion between people that you trust that are good and intelligent take advice and uh, the, the prophet sunnah was you know even on small matters take advice from two people that you trust on a matter because it may be that you know they will bring things to light that you did not realize or appreciate and in fact now we've realized even through social sciences and science that boardroom meetings or meetings often have a real uh, real purpose in, in, in directing what strategy you apply and often one man at the top who just makes all the decisions it gets messy okay that's that's very good to know so even these group of men what, what do they call these scholars coming together uh, they would just be uh, uh, the, the, I don't know if the, I don't know the Arabic word that we, you would use for them. But they would be among the elders, the, uh, the the educated, the scholars of the time, and the people would recognize them. That you know what, mashallah, these people are the are the scholars of the time. And mashwara or taking advice or or, or, or discussing is a great tradition within Islam uh, because it it um, often you know the, the the conclusions you arrive at will be far more robust, uh, you know, far more sensible. Because you may be a little bit rushed to make a decision, 
and somebody may say, well, have you thought about this? And you think, actually, I didn't. So it, it can make a very big difference. This is how, uh, this is how the Islamic way of rulership should be. Should be. What it, happens if the leader, the Khalifa, misbehaves? Is it a case of waiting till? Because he doesn't have like a. Um, well, in the world of democracy, you know, a prime minister will be in charge for a while, there will be another election, and in America, the president can only stay for two terms. The Khalifa, can he stay for as long as he wants? No. Okay. If he does something wrong, the, they can call a consensus and they can say that what he's done is completely unjust, it's haram in Islam, and I think we need to get rid of him, we need to get somebody else in. You don't have this fixed... 10 years that you know he's going to be now I appreciate people who are going to be hearing this are going to say oh but that's not how the Muslim world at the moment is being run right but that's not Islam Islam is the perfect rule of God human beings are not perfect throughout history we've had Muslim leaders as well who've been tyrants they've abused their own people they've abused people around them okay they wage war within their own people. But you know, corruption is a trait within human beings, not in God, not God's principles, not God's rules. Sharia is often very misunderstood. Because, uh, yeah, I mean, Sharia simply means a, a way, to find a way, like, it's like an oasis, you know? That's the Sharia. And Sharia in, is, interpret, in, is interpreted differently, sometimes at different times as well. So there was a, an astronaut, an astronaut, a Saudi astronaut, who went up on a NASA mission. And he said, what's the Sharia according to how I should pray? Now, you're not going to find that in the classic books, right? I'm talking about literal explanation. When you go out into outer space and you're circumnavigating the earth every 45 minutes, then this is how you pray, right? So that, that had to be an interpretation, but done by the scholars who said, okay, we have this uh, hadith in relation to traveling. Now, how can we apply that to something like this? And so they do what their best interpretation would be and they said, okay, well, you can't pray all your five prayers within 45 minutes because you're... So you stick to the time of your place of origin. And he was Saudi. So whatever the Saudi time is for prayer, you pray at that time. Okay. And those men, who chose them? Was it the leader of um, the king of Saudi Arabia? Or, or no, so, so in, in Saudi, things run a little bit differently, right? Because you have a, uh, uh, a royal family and it's, it's, things are operated slightly differently. But they've appointed who they feel are the most renowned scholars in Saudi to make the decisions. They have a huge university there, Medina University, many other universities, many foreign students study there as well from all different countries, including England and America and what have you. And so they, they've appointed who they feel are the best to, 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 to uh, uh, interpret the Sharia. I would really like so, to know their process of choosing. Yeah, I mean, look, those I mean, things... historically speaking, when... <laughs> Has there been any time historically where the caliph, Khalifa has done something bad and the, the, the scholars have said you have to I, I believe so. But there have been times when they've been unable to do so as well. So, for example, there have been tyrannical leaders who, if anybody stood against them, you'd be killed. So at that time, many of the Muslims, including many of the very senior Muslims, like some of the Sahaba, some of the companions, they never got involved in the politics. They said, I'm not going to take your side and I'm not going to take your side. I just want to practice my religion and live in peace. Because they knew by taking sides, it would mean bloodshed. They may have to kill one another and they didn't want it. So, you know, people are not perfect, but we feel that the, the Sharia, if, even if you look at modern society today, look at what's happened to our politics. It's corrupt. It's so, it's so corrupt. It's such a mess. Uh, that really we can't even claim that now the will of the people is heard anymore. But in Islam, if it was operated according to the Sharia, it would truly be the will of the people. Corrupt leaders would never be selected in the first place. Because if you have, um, if you have a lifestyle, for example, that is un-Islamic, they would never select you to start with. If you were known to be dishonest, they would never select you.
if they if you were known to uh, cor uh, do, be corrupt to people, they would never select you. So they would always go for somebody who was Islamically knowledgeable, practicing, and of course worldly, worldly knowledgeable as well. So the thing I wanted to ask, uh, when they're going through the process of uh, choosing the Sharia and they're choosing the Hadith, yes. do they look at the, <coughs> the two belts, the six authentic ones, they, they or do they choose three? No, they would generally look at a wide selection of Hadith, uh, Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood. They would also look at some of the... Yeah, they look. They look at all of the all the hadith. As many, there are scholars, mashallah, who you know could literally quote you hadith from you know dozens of sources, and they will give you why this one is weak, why this one is strong, why this one is preferable. Why... Now, of course, sometimes there will be a disagreement, and people will say, "Well, I prefer this uh, line of narrators because I believe of this, this, and this reason." And the other person may say, well, actually, I find strength in doing it this way. But How we... many of them would be there, though? How, How many? many of them would be there to make the decision? No, no. So, for example, I'm guessing they're let, let me vote. say, so, for example, if I have a problem with, um, let's say, uh, I'm doing a business okay. and I want to find out if my business is halal, yes. it's permissible, I may go and ask a scholar in my local community who may say, okay, email me the question. I will ask my teacher or my scholar who I trust on this matter. And we have now, alhamdulillah, scholars who are experts within finance. We have scholars who are experts within medicine. They themselves are doctors or surgeons and they're, and they're scholars. So we can direct those questions to people often who have the best ability. Now, even then, that is not a guarantee that you will get exactly the same answer. But what we have to appreciate is that those, uh, those uh, differences are often on most of the very small issues. We're not talking about, should I pray five times a day? Uh, should I go to Hajj in, once in my lifetime? Uh, is God one? Is the Quran from God? You know, is Prophet Muhammad the peace with the last prophet? Those are in stone. Yeah, that's the easy stuff. The, 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 the aqidah, the, the main aqidah, the foundation is in stone. Uh, the minor issues like in salah, in a prayer, should I hold my hands here? Or should they be here? You see? Those might be some discussion. Some people will say, actually, I find a lot of hadith to hold it up here. Some people will say, actually, it's okay to hold it here. Now, we don't believe, and scholars also say that these are minor things. Allah is not going to throw you into hell or heaven because you held your hands here or held. You understand my point? So we have to be, uh, you know, a little bit more pragmatic and understanding. A person who constantly looks for differences is looking for division. You know, when especially when it comes to minor issues, where you have uh, all this consensus. Uh, stick to the consensus, you know, um, often you find people argue about these minor things, they don't pray. I didn't even know they would, but then I know nothing about it, but I didn't think they would argue about the minor stuff. Yeah. But I wanted to ask, because you mentioned the, um, the hadith, you mentioned Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, you mentioned Sunan Abu Dawood. So what happens if a group of people from a different region, they set up their Sharia, but they don't use those hadiths? Is it still a Sharia? Yeah, yes, of course, because Sharia simply means uh, to find a, a path or a way. The way that you're finding is to God, right? To get closer to Allah, to be obedient to Allah's commands, okay? As long as they do what they do in good faith, in the best ability, the differences will be very small. Because there aren't that many things that are, like, I'm talking about in, in terms of aqidah, foundational things, that you could really have a, a, a massive debate on. It's the minor issues. Now, if they decide, well, we'd like to hold our hands here because of this reason, that's fine. When I go to my mosque, some people hold their hand here. Some are holding them slightly lower. It's perfectly fine. No, but I was asking more, like, if they chose to use hadiths, which are from the Sharia tradition and not the Sunni, so they wouldn't look at Sahih al-Bukhari. Yes. Would their Sharia be compromised or would it still be the way? It, it, it would depend, and I'll tell you why it would depend. 
So you might find certain hadith that you may only find in these books. Do you see my point? So knowledge is power. And the more knowledge you have, the more power you have in terms of how you interpret things. So it would be, it would be, I would say, um, for an academic, wrong to just chuck away entire whole swathes of books that are widely recognized as being very strong. I mean, it doesn't make sense, right? So, for example, I mean, in, in, you're studying law. If the top five books of law are widely recognized to be really good, you said, I'm going to do my degree, but I'm going to leave these five books out. It would be... You see my point? On a lesser note... Would you like some water? No, I'm afraid you're, you're it's off now. Yeah, thanks very much. On a lesser note, the other thing I was going to ask is, within the Sharia, is there compensation? Like I noticed within, uh, say, the United States of America, their legal system, when people have been incarcerated for decades and it transpires that they were actually innocent and they were released, they don't get any compensation. They have to get a lawyer and then they have to sue to get. Now, within the Sharia, are people, if they are incorrectly judged to be criminals and it transpires that they were innocent, is there like compensation for them? The, the, I, I believe that the Khalif who is in charge, the case can be brought to the, to the Khalif. And they can say that I was treated unjustly, unfairly, and this is what I have lost as a consequence. And the Khalif has, has the ability to say, okay, yes, he's lost out this much, give him this much as a compensation. And in Islam, if I kill somebody, even accidentally, I have to pay blood money to his family. I have to give blood money to his family. So it is regarded as a very serious thing. And if you kill somebody deliberately, you have to pay the blood money and, and kisas. The, 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 um, the uh, punishment is, is execution if you deliberately kill somebody. Premeditated murder, the Sharia says, is execution. It does not tolerate people going around killing people. Would the, would the guilty person have a lawyer to defend them? Or it's just an order that... It will go in front of the Qadi, the scholar. He will have his representative. They will have their representative. They will argue according to the Sharia, according to the law. And then the decision will be made. And finally then, anything that's going to be handed out. It's a, a process which is quite remarkable. Because we're talking about the 7th century. In the 7th century, there was no law, there was no order. And you imagine, at that time, these systems were set up. Prior to Islam, there was no law and order. It was a savage, savage society. None whatsoever, that's all. It was might is right. The Arabs lived with the... With the uh, well, even the, the Jewish, the... Uh, ben Banu Kharaida and yeah. Banu Qaynuka. Because they followed the uh, Torah, but they, they had the their laws. There. They had their laws. They lived in their communities, their, their, uh, fort, their forts. And uh, their laws were their laws. And so even when um, Islam conquered the whole of the Arabian Peninsula, the Jews were allowed to operate their Sharia. And the Muslims operated their Sharia. Unless if a Jew had done something to a Muslim, killed them or something like that, then the Sharia, now is a legal law that applies to everybody. But it was a system established, and this is where a lot of people don't appreciate that this is the 7th century where the world was full of savagery and Allah set down laws of inheritance, uh, you know, laws of governance, you know, uh, rights for women. You know, one of the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, you know, the best of you are the ones who are best to their wives. In the seventh century, you know, that is something that maybe people have only spoken about in the last 50 or 60 years. Be good to your wife. It's still a joke in the pub now about your women, about the wives and stuff. In Islam, actually, strictly speaking, you're not supposed to do that. You're not permitted, for example, to even talk about 
things between you and your wife uh, of an intimate nature as a joke is regarded as something that is very uh, disgusting, disgraceful, out of respect. From what you've said, you've actually just come to the question in my head. So within the Sharia, from what you've just told me, how is domestic abuse dealt with? Or is it not addressed? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he, and this is the seventh century. He brought the people in, and he warned them about abusing their wives. And in fact, when you think about it, you cannot force your wife to uh, do your cooking and your cleaning and your ironing and even looking after the kids. She doesn't have to do that. If she says, I, want, I need some help, you have to help her. And if you can't, you have to provide help for her. What if you refuse? Is she then allowed to get a lawyer or...? Yes, she can go to the Qadi and she... Qadi is a... How you... A judge, a judge. Qadi will be the judge. And she, a woman in Islam, now just imagine, 7th century, 7th century, if her husband is not able to satisfy her needs, you know what I mean, right? That is a legal ground for her within Islamic law, she can go to the Qadi and say that I want a divorce, because he's not able to satisfy my needs. How would she get the evidence? She doesn't need evidence. She doesn't need evidence? No! And the Qadi will, the judge will speak to both of them and they will give them time obviously to try to medical treatment, whatever is necessary. But at the end, if she insists, he can't satisfy me, the Qadi will grant the divorce. Seventh century. Does that apply now to the UK Sharia? Well, no, because you see, we have to abide by the law of the land. So we live in England, here we do a, a registry, a legal thing. Uh, there is an Islamic marriage which can be dealt with within the Islamic framework but you still have to go to the court and you still have to do things legally in this country because in Islam we have to abide by the law of the land. But there's no conflict because we can do the Sharia marriage and we can do the, uh, uh, the marriage within the courts as well. So it becomes legal in this country and it's legal within our religion. There's no conflict there for us. I did see a woman once who uh, was unhappy with a Sharia decision in the UK and she went to the courts, which kind of confused me because I thought that you could either choose one or the other. They weren't intertwined, but it seems that she was still able to challenge by going to a UK court, which surprised me. Oh, but she can because, remember, she's in the jurisdiction of the legal system of this country. So the law here recognizes a law, a marriage done in a registry office, right? That's been witnessed and, you know, signed and everything else. Now, uh, legally, she would still have to go there and have the marriage annulled anyway, because otherwise she's legally tied to the person, right? But what... I have remember our conversation that we, we have spoken before. Oh yes, that was uh, a many a long long time ago. A while ago, ago yeah, we were just talking about um, the word belief. Oh, I see. And uh, the discussion about uh, the Muslim prophet okay. speaking to Jibril and Allah in a cave, whether okay. it happened or not. Okay. That, that was that was ages ago. That's what we so said. where have you moved on in your journey of knowledge, though? Where where are you now? Well, what do you believe? My, my, oh, I'm still searching, but as you can see from the questions I've asked you. Part of my search for the truth has involved looking at the laws from various religions. So I've had discussions with Jews about um, what's in the Torah, and I'm having a discussion with a Muslim about what I've noticed in uh, Sharia, which is why I learned about, you know, the shir Sharia will be made up with verses, surahs and ayahs from the Quran, certain hadiths, and there's uh, another process, Ijma. And so I was learning all about that. So I then, so I'm still searching, asking questions, doing research. But then when I do the research, I think it's also important that I talk. To Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. It. Alhamdulillah. That's, that's very that's, good. That's, what I'm doing. that's very good. But in terms of your concept or your anchor to believe in a creator, are you there yet, or are you? Is that something that you're still debating? Oh, no, or? I want to believe in a creator, but then I'm still trying to find out whose truth is the truth about the Creator. Because I want to believe that there, there is something out there, because I don't really want to fall into the um, the realm of believing that everything around us is coincidental. To me, there are too many amazing things for me to believe it's all coincidental. I believe there's an external source responsible. But whose truth defines that external source? Is it 
what I used to be a Christian, or is it what the Jews say, or is it what the Muslims say? So that's when I do the research and I look at the laws and the spirituality. But one of the things I would say to you there is that if you look at the you know, the poster there, for example, of all of the religions that we find, generally their core core teaching is this one all-powerful being. Now, whether we say creator, whether we say God, whether we say Allah, or whether we refer to that one single all-powerful creator being as what the other religions may refer to him as, that one thing I think is pretty universal. So at least what I would suggest to you, perhaps if you accept that, I will, that, I'll at least why. accept that first yes, yes, foundational. Because you know. the tribe that I'm a part of in Africa, there's a the tribe I'm a part of the Yorubas. Some of them are Muslims, some of them are Christians, some of them stick with the Yoruba religion. Now within the Yoruba religion, even there, there is this belief in the Creator, Lord Mari, right, the right. So as you the all powerful, all knowing. Yeah. So, yeah, and this one thing is amazing because we find this. Universal, you know, in South America, in America, you know, in Aborigine uh, Australia, everywhere you find this concept of this one and only powerful being. Except for the ancient Greeks. Well, of course, they had many mixed up ideas, right? And there are obviously anomalies everywhere. So what I would suggest to you is that if you are convinced that this could not have just happened by accident, and that the universe itself needs an explanation as to where it came from, then it would be quite rational, I think, to believe in this almighty creator that's responsible for everything. So if you accept that, then of course your journey can start in finding out, you know, you said you were Christian, I think, before, right? And I've still got family members trying to pull me back to Christianity. Yeah, and if you look at the core message of Christianity, God is one. God is absolute, God is all-knowing, uh, you know, uh, God is merciful, which is what the Jews believe, which is what the Muslims believe, which is what all of the major religions actually believe. The only thing I suppose, you know the main difference between Christianity and Islam is the Trinity, basically. But there is much, there is much actually... If you know, I'll, I'll leave you now because I know what's about to happen. No, no, no. It was a pleasure but I'll speak to you. I'll speak to you. I'll speak to you. There will be a cloning sacrifice and Messiah is coming to... All right. If you don't mind, uh, brother, if you don't mind... A cloning sacrifice. Okay. That's the core message of the Bible. Okay. It's not that God is one and only and absolute? Of course. Of okay. Course. So, so, so that's why I'm saying. But the core message of the Bible is that Messiah will return. Is going to be our atoning sacrifice. Okay. That's the core message from Genesis to Revelation. Okay. If I can yeah. go back to our discussion. Yeah. So even if you were to accept what he said. I, I recognize what yeah, he said. Even if you accept what he said or, or recognize oh. what he said, that the reality oh. is that the core, let's say, foundational teaching of Jesus was that God is one, God is only, God is absolute. That's his literal words that came out of his mouth, right? Uh, and the word in, in, in Hebrew, echad, means uniquely, uniquely one. Unity. In you, unity. Uniquely. No, in, you can't make unity. up, listen, you can't one make up unity. English words. One, you one can't make up English words. It doesn't mean no, no. that. One in you unity. can't make up English words. The Jews, who, who, the Jews yeah. who know the Torah, yeah who speak the Hebrew, they understand that word echad as uniquely one. No. Now, 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 when if... husband please, and wife, they marry, we have a, they get married, yeah. they become echad. No, they don't. They they're still two people, they aren't they? Are a, one unit. No, they're not one, one unit. unit. They're not, they they're not, they're not one. Unit. They are two in one. They're not. They're they not. are two in one. They don't become when Siamese. They, when they get married, okay, they don't become, when they get married, okay. they become I'd like two to have, in one. I'd like to have they, a calm they, they, discussion they with this brother. Discussion. But please. Uh, I, no, but, but I don't interrupt, the, please. The, the, okay, but don't way, interrupt. The way you are lying here. Okay, all right. The way you are lying here, you need to be corrected here. Let me lie to the brother. But don't you interrupt me. To, no, don't you, interrupt you me, to be please. Corrected. I'm asking okay. you nicely. Am I telling anything wrong? Okay. No, you're lying. I, I know what I'm, you're saying. I'm asking you nicely. So okay. So I'm asking you. I'm asking you as a Christian, no, right? Listen. When, when husband and wife I, I they <laughs> marry together, you say, you say they become lying. one. Brother, according to brothers, 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 according to Bible, what the Lord has put together, that's right. So 
so they are a unit in one right. no. yeah so god god is a father son son and holy spirit yeah, Yeah, they are three in one. Okay. We we are. So You're a Christian, right? Hero Israel. You're a the Christian. Lord your God. You're a Christian. One God. You're a Christian, right? Hero Israel. The Lord your, your God your Christian, is right? one God. You're Christian, right? Yes. I'm asking you very nicely. Hero Israel. I'm asking you very nicely. Yes. Yes. Please let me have my discussion with this brother. No, no. Please don't interrupt me anymore. But no, you, be a, but be a you good Christian. Saying, be a good I Christian. I second. I second. Be a good Christian. You said. You said okay. God is one. Be a I good, said yes. Five. God is one. Be a good, Hero Israel. The Lord your God is one God. Okay. But that God is a father, brother, word, brother, brother, and spirit. Brother. Word and spirit. I know. Yes. Okay. I know what you're saying. I know all of it. Yes. I just want to hear his perspective. Right. Okay. Yeah. But I don't yeah. disagree with what you're saying. Now, what I would like to say, yeah. I'm asking you very nicely. Yes. Please be respectful. Yes. I'm having a conversation with this brother. Yeah. Because what I don't want to do, and you don't see me doing very often here at all. I know. I don't like to shout at people and discuss no. things in yeah. that way. Yeah. I don't want to shout over you. That's right. And then you shout over okay. me. It's disrespectful. Yeah. Please. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So basically, going back to the oneness of the Creator <laughs> in Islam. and in Judaism this joining of the creator is complete and utter blasphemy in any way whatsoever so even when prophet muhammad peace be upon him died the khalif abu bakr the first khalif he said to the people all of you who worship muhammad know that muhammad is dead and all of you who worship the lord that muhammad worship know that he is ever living We do not join yeah. Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam peace be upon him or Jesus or Moses or Abraham or any of the prophets with the divinity of God. We believe that they were human beings, the best of human beings sent to humanity, Jesus, Moses, Abraham, Muhammad, peace be upon all of them. And they were the best of examples to us. but we do not elevate them as others not just christians as others previously elevated their people to a status of worship we worship nothing but the creator so we worship the one who sent jesus we worship the one who jesus spoke to we worship the one that jesus prayed to but we don't worship jesus and we don't worship muhammad and we don't worship moses This is our doctrine. This is exactly what the Jews believe in terms of the oneness of God. Now there are unitarian Christians who don't believe in the Trinity. There are trinitarian Christians who do believe in the Trinity. That's their choice. That's their choice. Look, I I say respectfully that's their choice. If they believe it, they feel they have grounds to believe it, that's their choice. But for us as Muslims, we don't join anything to God. Can I please read something from a Genesis chapter You've asked me very nicely. Of the, of the Please do. Genesis. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, continue, continue your journey, inshallah. But what I would say to you is this. My brother. That just as we make our decisions quickly, yes. when the consequences are grave or could be grave, we make the contemplation very, very quickly, the analysis very, very quickly, and we try to come to a conclusion, a decision. Because... Life and death is not in your hands or my hands. I could drop de- I could drop dead here time now, out, right? Before, yeah, could you could out. be before crossing you, the road and you're gone. Before right? you go, right? So what I would say is that I'm not saying rush into it, but don't be so complacent that you become like me an old gray man and you're still thinking about it. Yeah, you know? You, you know? You coming back uh, let, next week or let probably, probably, or maybe we'll meet something. Let me read, let me read nice this verse you, from Genesis chapter 1.